Hey, James Carity here, back with another awesome episode of the Hoops Think Show, where we break down the game and build it back up. Special guests lined up for you today. We're talking to Brett Cormanos, who's a writer at Grantland.com. He formerly wrote for the NBA Playbook.com, and he's coached at a few different levels, including the ABA. He's a big time proponent of the spread, pick, and roll. And in this episode, we're talking about the best cheapest easiest ways for a team to quickly build themselves into a squad that can beat just about anybody so great episode and i hope you enjoy it i gotta give a quick shout out to my boys at brew pony if you're a basketball nerd like me that means a lot of late nights and early mornings and that means caffeine but don't drink crappy coffee brew pony delivers fresh artisan coffee into your mailbox every month it's very affordable the coffee is fantastic and i got you hooked up 10% 10% off if you go there and enter coupon code HOOPSTHINK. So again, that's www.brewpony.com. 10% off with coupon code HOOPSTHINK. Get on it. Hey guys, welcome back to HOOPSTHINK. James Carity here. I am here with the awesome Brett Coromanos, who writes over at Grantland and a couple other places he's been featured online. Brett, how you doing, man? I'm doing good, James. How much stuff? I'm doing well, man. Excited to have you on here today. Could you tell everybody a little bit about just, you know, kind of your story and your perspective? I know you used to coach in the ABA a little bit and have done some other cool stuff, so tell everybody what's up. Um, yeah, no, I'm just kind of a, you know, normal normal uh, low-level coach. Uh, started in high school ranks, actually started in high school girls basketball, uh, then moved to the guys' side, uh, did both team and individual training, um, got hooked up with a, just a semi-pro team, which is basically – you know, guys that are either coming back from low-level Europe that are trying to get back over there, or uh, younger guys just out of maybe Division Three or you know, low-level Division One that are trying to, to get a, a European contract. Um, and so, I mean, it was you know that those were some good experiences for me. I mean, you learn really at every every year of the level that you do, uh, the more involved that you get, you know, you're able to look back and always kind of you know take the theory of coaching and and you know kind of go against the practical nature of what you can actually get accomplished and. Um, it was good experiences, and then with the writing side, I came up uh, through ESPN.com's True Hoop Network. Um, got very fortunate to land with Grant Land, and you know that allows me to kind of connect with people that I, you know, normally wouldn't be able to connect with, and actually directly ask questions related to coaching and, and ideas and concepts. And so it's really helped me grow as a, uh, I guess, basketball coach, knowledgeable guy. Um, I'm still trying to get to the actual knowledgeable part, but I'm moving closer towards it. <laughs> You don't give yourself enough credit, my friend. <laughs> well, I try. I try to. I try to stay a, as modest as I can because there are a lot of really sharp people in this industry, and I, I got a long way to go to catch up with them. I, I feel like we're kind of seeing a, a bit of a movement at how players are evaluated these days, and you know, I want to talk about point guards a little bit because I feel like you know when people talk point guards, you know, we hear about guys like Chris Paul and Russell, Russell Westbrook and how many points they score and how many assists they get, but you know, to me, with how much teams run the pick and roll these days, I feel like what we should really be judging guys on is, you know, how well they can score and facilitate out of the pick and roll. And, you know, that's not something that I feel like is really understood very well. So, you know, quick question to you on that. You know, who do you feel like are the top point guards in terms of running the pick and roll, both for themselves and for teammates? And, and you know, just a couple little points about why for each of them. Um, well, I think Jose Colorado is a guy that always jumps up as undervalued. Um I mean, anybody, anybody who is unfortunate enough to follow me on Twitter realizes that probably during the season, um, you know, I'll, I'll make a mention of him at, at least a couple times a week almost. It seems I do like. the same thing, man. I, I got a little bit of flack over it. Yeah, and, and, it, and it's hard because people don't um, – I think what the problem is, and this is going a little bit away from individual players, but I think what the problem is in terms of uh, really valuing the pick and roll is the only thing that we have right now is synergy data that says – they get X points per possession themselves. So this player gets, you know, 0.9 points per possession. It puts him in the 80th percentile. That, that it's, uh, for us, at least, you know, as the, as the writer, as the conduit, is the only data that we can really present. But that doesn't tell the whole story. I actually think that synergy stats, I think it's a great service, but that stat is a little bit flawed in the sense that what you should be tracking is when a pick and roll is run. So let's say, you know, a team comes down the floor. Jose, we'll, we'll say our Jose, Jose Colorado is coming down the floor. He, you know, he goes into a side pick and roll. They've done it. He moves the ball out. 
it gets passed to the corner man. The corner man drives and kicks and skips it across the floor and it leads to an open shot. Exactly. Nothing comes back to Jose Calderon, but his initial pass out of it leads to the scrambling defense, which leads to the eventual shot. So there's not even a hockey assist, um, but the, the, the shot creation from it is still there. Um, and I think that is why guys like Calderon, when, it, you, when you say this guy's an offensive force, if, you, if, player, if people don't see him you know, in and out in and out of big and getting to the rim on a pick and roll or pulling up and shooting a jump at the elbow and constantly hitting that shot or you know, being like Nash who gets a lot of immediate assists where he'll pocket pass to the rolling big and he'll deliver it at a point where the big man can just take one dribble and finish. Um, you know, or he'll find it, he'll hook pass out of it and hit a guy who gets an immediate open shot because he can he can make reads on the floor that normal human beings can't. Um, you know, th- those those are the things that you know we kind of immediately equate to pick and roll play. But you know, I think guys and I wrote about this a little bit when I wrote about Milwaukee earlier uh, last season, where Brandon Jennings when he had that run where he was uh, garnering a lot of assists and a lot of attention. Yeah. The thing that changed with him wasn't so much that he was getting guys to convert immediate shots out of off his passes was that he would run the action to run the action. And what I mean by that is is he would run the pick and roll without looking for something self-serving for him. Or he didn't get the immediate highlight pass, or he didn't get the immediate shot out of it. He would just make the read, whatever the read was. If the big guy dove and the weak side wing crashed on the big and he just moved it out to the weak side wing, that's what he needs to do. And that's the right read, and that's what's good offense. Um, And until we can really track that, it's going to be always a disconnect between the players that maybe I feel are undervalued in terms of running the pick and roll, um, you know, versus what you know we see and the data can show us right now, you know. So I'll mention someone like Calderon, and people will say, you know, oh, you know, Tony Parker is way better than him. And I think if we had a, a way to really measure it accurately, you would see that maybe the difference between the two isn't that big, if there is a difference at all, you know. Exactly, man. I completely agree with you. And, you know, I kind of wondered to see, you know, what we can do to maybe do a better depth track and some of this stuff. Like, Synergy actually does a little bit more. They they have, like, this stack called, uh, like, derived offense where mm-hmm. they'll track not just, like, the core pick and roll, but, like, the next pass after the pick and roll to see if it goes out to, like, a spot-up shooter or somebody cut into the basket. So they track a little bit more of that. But, it, you know, like you were saying, it only captures a fraction of, the ball movement that's really going on. So maybe Sport VU can offer us a little bit more in the way of tracking that kind of stuff. I hope so because, you know, as we're talking about with Calderon, I feel like he's kind of one of those guys who, because he's not like an ISO guy and, you know, maybe partially because he's never played with, like, a really dominant, like, pick-and-roll big man, maybe that's part of it. Because I feel like, you know, when we talk about some of the pick-and-roll guys, you know, like how much of Steve Nash's success is the fact that he played with Amari for all those years? Know? It kind of makes you wonder a little bit. So. Well, I, I think the other thing, too, and, I, and uh, this came up, uh, one of the things that I, I wrote about again was uh, Will Bynum with the Pistons. Yeah. And they ran a bench lineup, which was, I think it was Will, it was uh, Will Bynum, it was Rodney Stuckey, uh, it was Austin Day, um, or Austin Day, and then, and then Kyle Singler at certain points. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it was Drummond as the dive man, and it was Charlie Villanueva as a stretch big. Ooh. And what that did is it put three shooters in the corner uh, to spread the floor, and it was basically allowing you know Bynum and Drummond to kind of play two on two with every other defender kind of latched onto a shooter. And Stuckey isn't isn't great from outside, but he was good from I think the left corner. Um, and so you know obviously with the way that scouting prep goes into it, you know he whether, whether no matter what way they communicated, they probably actually said you know we're going to stay a little bit tighter to him when he's in this spot. Um, you know, whether or not they got back to the player or whatever, we don't know. But totally. the point being is that uh, Will Bynum looked like Allen Iverson in a spread pick and roll situation. Exactly. And, um, you know, I think that that helps. You know, so when you look back at the Nash year, um, you know, my favorite year with him was 2010. And that was when they had Channing Fry. They brought Channing Fry over and he oh, yeah. offered them a brand convention. And it, it took a team that was, I believe, below 500 for a certain point during that season. I think they were, yeah. And I think it, it took a team that generally people wrote off as maybe not even a, a playoff team in the Western Conference, and they west, went to the Western Conference Finals. Now, granted, Nash's whole career has always elevated teams because he's uh, a very unselfish player. He always is looking to make guys better. Um, but I think that is a blueprint that you saw again in the Dallas Mavericks. You know, Jason Kidd as the ball mover, and they had the same type of spread system that, again, I think it uh, it makes the uh, – 
I guess, the team as a whole better than the collective individual pieces. You know, because when you look back on that Mavericks team, when you look back on that Sun team, it was Amari and Steve Nash. And that was pretty much it. You know, they had yeah, Jason exactly. in, uh They had Jared Dudley. You know, they had Channing Fry. You know, Goran Dragic was not the Goran Dragic that we know today, but he was improving. Correct. But it wasn't, you know, an all-star team. There wasn't a Chris Bosh, a Dwayne Wade, a LeBron James. Uh, um, Dallas Mavericks, same thing. It was a fantastic all, all-time player, uh, but he's also a, a kind of a one-dimensional player in the fact that he doesn't really give you a lot of value on the defensive end of the floor. Um, and then it was, you know, then, then you look back and you say, well, who's their next important piece? Well, Jason Kidd was their captain and their ball mover. Tyson Chandler was a defensive anchor and dive man. Um, you know, after that, you know, was it Jason Terry? Uh, was it J.J. Barea off the bench? Um, you know, it's really hard to even to figure out who was next. And if you look at those names, those are all solid NBA players. All have great, you know, have had good to great careers. Yeah. And But they are nowhere near the star caliber players that you think you need to win a championship. Exactly. Or have next to a player like Dirk. But what they did is they maximized their assets with their offensive system, which was, Spreading the floor, and whether it was Dirk at the elbow, drawing a double team, moving the ball out, or running pick and rolls with JJ Barea, where he was kind of in a spread situation where he could run with a pick and pop man, you know, with Dirk. And when when anybody is is guarding Dirk and they got a hedge on a ball screen, they are far more concerned with getting back to Nowitzki than they are with stopping the ball handler. And so that is part of the reason why JJ Barea got a nice deal after that is when Dirk Nowitzki is, is your pick-and-roll partner and his big man doesn't even care about the fact that you're dribbling the basketball because he just wants to get back one of the best big, big exactly. man in the history of the game, you're going to look a lot better. Um, and that's part of the reason why I love the spread, the, the spread pick-and-roll. It's just an undervalued asset in the game. And why I think you know the tracking of it is going to be vitally important is because I think it is the, 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 the cheapest way to make a team more competitive um, without having the star talent that you, that every every GM will tell you they need, they need two stars, they need exactly. three stars, they need a full functional five man thing. And I think with shooting and a good pick and roll guard, you can get away with a lot less and still be very successful. Now, can you win a, a championship? You know, with Will Bynum as your starting point guard, <laughs> no. But at the same token, you can maybe be a playoff team with the right pieces around if you really emphasize, you know, spreading the floor, moving the ball, run, pick and roll. And the Spurs have kind of shown that in the sense that, you know, Manny Ginobili completely disappeared over the last few years. I mean, it's sad to see because I think he's every, one of everybody's all-time favorite players. Um, but, you know, as he was breaking down, as Tim Duncan wasn't able to bring in every game as a scoring option in the post, um, you know, the Spurs just with ball movement and high volume pick and rolls were one of the best teams in basketball almost one of the finals. So... Um, you know, I think that's there's something to that in just terms of the value that it brings. Definitely, man. I completely agree. And, you know, something tells me this is probably exactly what the Mavericks are thinking right now, bringing in Calderon the way they did. You know, they're looking to extend Dirk's window. You know, maybe they're thinking they can get back to the spread pick and roll action with, with Calderon, who, you know, as we've talked about extensively on this interview so far, you know, mm-hmm. he's one of the best in the business. And, I, you know, I felt really good about the contract that they got him on. I felt like that was a pretty good deal. So... I feel like if you're the Mavericks, that's probably the best, cheapest, most you know inexpensive way to keep your window going. So I think that makes a lot of sense for them. Yeah, I mean, I think the the thing too with the Calderon deal that wasn't talked about enough is that you know he's an older he's an older player and it, it was a lot of dollars, um, but he does a lot for your offense. Um, and I think that he'll he'll be a guy that's going to always age well because he's got good size, never relied on athleticism. He's got a good outside shooting stroke. Um, those players typically tend to still be very productive, um, just given you know the size and skill set as they move forward. Um, the curious thing for me wasn't so much the deal they signed him to; um, it was what they put around him. Um, because when, when I think when you get a guy like Jose, you know the thing that you have to do is you have to have you know wings that can defend. Uh, and they went out and signed Monte Ellis, um, you know, which is going to be a tough choice. I mean, he's never been able to to be a positive defender at the NBA level. Um, you know, for me, the deal would have made a lot more sense if they would have put the pieces where Jose was the point guard. They had two really solid wings that could defend and shoot, you know, Jay Crowder at the three, whoever it is, uh, and Dirk, and then a, a defensive big man. You know, that would mirror more of, like, the kind of ideal uh, player structure that you have around a guy like Jose. Yeah, but having two negatives in the backcourt because Jose can't defend very well and it's not going to get any better with age. Um, you know, that's going to be that's going to be tough for them. But I, I do think the deal – in a vacuum was uh, was definitely kind of bashed, and I don't know if it really should have been. 
um, given the amount of value you can bring to an NBA offense. Yeah, I agree. Well, they, they did manage to bring in Ellington, and they do still have Vince, so that gives you a little bit of the 3-and-D, but we'll see. But anyway, man, I, I want to start wrapping this up, but, you know, one of the things I kind of want to leave people with, you know, we've talked a lot about how we how much we feel the pick-and-roll is undervalued, and, you know, what, what are a couple things that people watching this call right now can really kind of look for when they're watching the game to evaluate, like, how – how well a team and a point guard especially is running the pick and roll. Like, What are a couple of the, of the little things that maybe aren't so obvious that you won't hear the broadcasters or the writers talking about? You know, What are a couple of the things that these guys do? Because you know, obviously you know, we both know it's tough, to, it's tough to track these things with stats. So what are some things that you can look for with the eye? What do you think? Well, I think it's more just uh, grading the possession as a whole. Um, yeah. That would be you know, you know, the big picture sense. Um, you know, they run a pick and roll, but if the, the you know, it, it's easy to ball watch too. Um, you know, whether it's the casual fan, whether it's me, um, you know, you can stuff watch the basketball and a lot goes on behind the play. And you always judge, you know, the process. You know, the ball moved, it got to shot. If he missed the shot, that's no big deal. Was it created in a good way? You know, did he have to step back from mid range to get a shot off? Um, or did the ball move and he was wide open? He just missed a great opportunity, right? Um, so I think kind of grading the possession as a whole. You know, once the pick and roll starts, where does the chain reaction end? You know, and then, you know, kind of see how it opens up the floor. And that means watching things behind the play rather than watching the direct two-man game that is, you know, is, that usually starts it off. Um, and I would say the other thing is just watching the individual ball handler. Um, you know, does he set up the pick and roll? Does he make the right read? Where was, you know, and th this usually requires the old rewind button on the DVR. Absolutely. Um, where you got to go back and, and you got to watch it, you know. So if he's getting down on the side, you know, did he have a window to make a pocket pass? Did he did he make the right pass out? You know, what was his pace like? Did he try to drive on a direct line where he had no direct line? Um, and just kind of continue to kind of go over those things and just say, you know, okay, you know, let's let's process as he goes through. How was his pace? Did he make the right read out? You know, and then once you look at that, you can actually really fairly grade the possession because, you know, it's very easy to see, you know, a guy like, you know, not to pick on Jennings, but a guy like Jennings, you know, get down on a side pick and roll, which is where they force to the baseline and away from the middle of the floor, and he'll take two dribbles 17 feet and he'll pull up and he'll make a jumper, and people will be like, well, he ran that well. Well, that's he just made the shot that the defense wanted, wanted to give him. Um, you know, whereas... You know, let's say he, he drags a big man all the way down to the baseline and then throws it back to either big that's staying high at the elbow and then that big reverses the ball the opposite side of the floor and gets into another pick and roll and then they get to go middle on a pick and roll and then that leads to a layup or a free throw. Well, then Brandon really did his job. That's actually a much better possession than him just making the jumper. Um, and so that's kind of what you got to do is you got to really focus away from the ball behind the play, you know, the stuff that doesn't show up on Sports Center where you go, oh, I saw that dunk last night. Exactly. Well, you can say, no one wants to say, oh, well, I saw that guy dive to the rim and then <laughs> the hit the guy lifted on the I wing. I say that. <laughs> That's the top ten play, you know. Um, and it's, it's, you know, it's definitely something that, you know, nerdy you know, basketball guys like us, we want to watch and we want to see and we really enjoy. Um, but, it, you know, they enjoy the game where they're, they're, they're trying to get into coaching. You know, that's the stuff that really matters. Is you got to get away from the flash. you got to get away from the media. Um, you know, feedback of a great open jumper and all that was great. And he made such a cool move to get to get open and look at the offense as a whole and just try to watch away from the play and see if guys are doing their job away from the play. Um, and that's the best way to kind of grade it and evaluate it. Great point, man. Really appreciate that. Well, Brett, thanks again for stopping by today, man. Appreciate it. It's thanks been a lot of fun. Me. Hope to have you on again sometime. Hope you enjoyed this episode. The spread pick and roll is such a deadly weapon at every level of the game. And one you got to look for is just so damn underrated. So thanks again for tuning in for this episode. I had a great time. And make sure you subscribe to this channel. And more importantly, get on the email list at www.hoopsthink.com. It's the best way to get the latest updates and everything that we're putting out with Hoops Think, both on this YouTube channel and on the site itself. So get on the list. And thanks for tuning in.